Hi, I'm Gayla Scrivener, ex-corporate girl and now work-from-anywhere adventure seeker. Creating a work-from-anywhere lifestyle isn't without its challenges, but those challenges certainly don't overshadow all the many benefits. What breaks my heart is seeing folks stuck and unhappy in a career and lifestyle when they want more out of life. I believe that we all have the opportunity to create the life of our dreams and earn a living in fun and creative ways to make our dream lifestyle a reality. You too can experience wonderful adventure and freedom as you live life on your own terms. In this weekly podcast, I share experiences when it comes to growing a lifestyle business through guest interviews, content marketing experience and perspectives, virtual leadership lessons, and I'll even throw in some travel adventures. My hope is through all the interviews, the tips, advice, and personal experience, you'll be inspired and motivated to keep going and creating your dream lifestyle. Life's an adventure. There's no time but the present to live life to the fullest. Hi there, and welcome to the show. If you're listening around the time that this episode is released, we're coming upon Mother's Day. And I have to tell you, my mom is pretty special to me. I remember as a kid, I'd tell my mom all the time that she was my favorite mom. Now She would always smile at me and respond by saying, I'm your only mom. What I couldn't figure out how to express then is that I was trying to tell her that compared to my friends and the dynamic of the relationship they had with their moms, I wouldn't trade what we had for anything. Yes, she is my only mom, but compared to other mom and kid relationships I saw, I knew we had something pretty special and I knew it pretty young. Mom, if you're listening, as I know you do sometimes, happy Mother's Day. You're my favorite. Now, with Mother's Day coming up just on Sunday, I thought it would be a perfect time to bring Dr. Michelle Deering back onto the show. Dr. Deering believes that every mother and daughter should have a thriving, loving relationship. This refreshing approach has made her a sought-after speaker online educator, and consultant. Before running her consulting business, Michelle served as a licensed psychologist and board-certified psychologist at a Big Ten University. She's been a Fortune 500 corporate trainer and higher education professional. Nowadays, you'll find her speaking at conferences, training for her next Reebok Spartan sprint race, and practicing on her drum kit all the while coaching, serving clients, and recording her hit podcast, Mother Daughter Connections. I think it's fantastic how Dr. Deering had turned her passion of the importance of the mother-daughter relationship into her business without boundaries. In this interview, we talk about her journey from the corporate world to a traditional medical practice then opening up her knowledge, her experience, and her expertise to the whole world. Now let's hop right into the interview, shall we? Well, hey there, Michelle. I am so glad that you're back on the show. (laughs) I'm so excited. Yes, it's been a whole year, and Mm -hmm. I wanted to bring you back because I just love what you do. I just love you, and Uh, I I love how you serve your community, and I love how you're growing your solopreneur business, and I thought it was high time that we had another conversation, so I wanted to bring you back on the show. It's been a whole year Mm -hmm. since you've been here, and that's a long time, so I'd like to start out with telling everyone a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, my name is Dr. Michelle Deering, and I'm a mother-daughter relationship personal trainer. I'm also a licensed psychologist in New Jersey and North Carolina, as well as a board-certified sports psychologist. But my heart and my passion is to help moms have healthy relationships with their daughters uh, through all the stages of life that they will both be going through (laughs) throughout their lives. How long have you been doing what you're doing with your mother-daughter relationship? personal okay. trainer role. Right, right. <laughs> well, uh, I, the way I'll, I'll answer that question is I've been licensed as a psychologist and practicing for over 22 years. And probably in the last 
four, three to four years was, especially after my book, What Mothers Never Tell Their Daughters, came out in 2018. Ever since then was where I started to pivot to really just do what was really on my heart, which is to help moms. I just really want, moms need a lot of help. And I just want to be that, that supportive, non-judgmental, safe place person for, to help them uh, in their relationship with their daughters. So to answer your question directly, about the last four years. Yeah, yeah. What is your business name? Uh, Curative Connections uh, is the name of my company. Mm -hmm. And the way that came about is through just the therapeutic work that I would do with clients over the years. I've really understood and I believe that the connection that we have to ourselves is the key connection that we need in order to connect in a healthy way with others and connect to what our real goals are, what we really desire. And so that's how the, the word curative connections came up. I love that. I yes. love that. With your own solopreneur business, mm-hmm. I, mean, do you, I know that in your past life that you're a sports psychologist for Big Ten mm-hmm. University mm-hmm. and a corporate trainer mm-hmm. and a higher ed- education mm-hmm. professional. Do you still have a corporate job? Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> oh, gosh. And I love that. And it's like, that's said with enthusiasm. Right yes. With, with, with my <laughs> I respect the women, even the men, anyone who's out there in the corporate arena, because it takes a lot. I mean, corporations run our country, but the, the, they all started off in a solopreneur, solopreneurship type venture. That's where they started off. And then they just grew and then became corporations. So anyone who's working in a corporate environment, awesome. And I don't downplay it. Uh, It contributes to society in a very positive way. For me, (laughs) you know, I once said to my husband that I wouldn't have made a really good person in the in the armed forces, even though, you know, I, I almost went to West Point, I was accepted and whatnot, mm-hmm. but I was like, I asked too many questions. <laughs> That's my whole thing. I'm a very curious person by nature. Um, I want to know backstories. I, I, I want to know the whys behind what we do. And I found that while I did very well in the corporate arena, being both a, a human resource um, a human resource trainer, and then a community outreach person, as well as a graduate school admissions officer at the collegiate level. I didn't like being behind a desk. I wanted to be out and about with people, really just getting to know them individually and uh, as groups. When I say, oh yeah, I'm not in the corporate arena anymore, I don't like the confines that it has in terms of systems and things taking a really long time to to change because I'm the kind of person if I see something and I think it can be done better or in a way that's more efficient or in a way that's more personable, that's the real thing for me, then that's what I want to do. I want to be able to just do it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I find that I have that kind of flexibility as a person who's my own boss. (laughs) Well, yeah, because we can (laughs) navigate the waters a lot better when we're a small entity Mm -hmm. and make a big impact when we're a small entity entity. That's the cool thing. Did you have anybody in like your family or you have any experience on running your own business? Like uh, have any entrepreneurs close to you to draw from? Actually, um, no, in the, in the traditional sense, uh, no one in my family was an entrepreneur. Uh, I know that my mom, when she, she emigrated from Jamaica, but back on the island, as we say, <laughs> she had her own reputation and business as a seamstress. And so folks would come to her to do that kind of work. And so when she came to this country, not knowing the systems here in the country uh, back in the 30s, 40s, you know, it was a, back, a different time back then for anyone uh, who knows history. And so the opportunities weren't as prevalent for her back then. She had a lot to do with dealing with the fact that she, you know, had left my biological father because he was abusive to her. And so she was just trying to survive. And so in that regard, even though she didn't do that here in the United States, I would see her tooling, tooling, tooling all the time, having two, three jobs, working long hours. And so I knew 
that there was something to be said for hard work and that you had to do that and, and be good at what you did so that you could have a sense of pride about what you were contributing to positively in the United States. So I think that was something that I gleaned from her just by observation. It wasn't like she looked at me and said, oh, you need to go do <laughs> an entrepreneurial right. endeavor. It was just the way she lived her life. With that, that has a lot of influence on navigating what we want to do in life. Did you have any influencers that helped you along the way on your entrepreneurial journey? Well, in terms of once my, the reason my book, What Mothers Never Tell Their Daughters, mm -hmm. was published by Author Academy Elite, AAE. And I had pitched my book idea to different publishing places, but AAE was the first time, it's run by Carrie Oberbrunner, it was the first time I had actually heard someone say, look, if you write a book, think bigger than just wishing and a hoping and a praying that someone will pick up your book <laughs> and read it and be impacted. Think of it as the basis for launching your own business. I had never heard that before. I thought, oh, really? I'd always wanted to write a book about something that I cared about. I didn't know that I could actually make this my life's mission and work. That was a big thing. And then being part of the AE community, that's where I started learning about the importance of having some kind of plan, not necessarily a business plan, but some kind of plan for how you wanted to present yourself and get the word out about your message, about your mission, about your movement. That was very instrumental for me because it was through AAE that I then learned the importance of being part of an online community. That even though we back then pre-COVID, we would meet yearly in person, there was an online community that was very vibrant and still is that I started seeing, okay, there are other ways to connect with people in addition to doing the local going to networking meetings. There are other people that I can reach through social media, through the internet. And that was something totally new to me. So you wrote your book. It was just true to your heart. Mm -hmm. But if you never went into that, you may still be in corporate life. Not oh. knowing the other <laughs> other things? Yeah, actually, you're asking some really good questions here because when I think back to my career goals, my original career goal was to become a medical doctor. And I only knew that it was one route to that. Go to undergrad, go to med school, <laughs> and then do your yeah. fellowship, and then your residency, and then come out as a, doc a medical doctor. And so that was the path I was on until organic chemistry. But then that was the path <laughs> I was on. And then I was, try I was basically figuring it out. From there, I went to become a high school teacher of math and science. And from there, I went to corporate arena where I was, you know, as I said, I worked in client services and then eventually in human resources as a trainer. It, but it was my transition from being in corporate to my very next position after that was as a graduate admissions officer of a graduate school. It was that position that actually gave me a taste of what it was like to not just be behind a desk, but to actually have to go out and recruit. And so it was that aspect that, oh, I could actually have a job, quote unquote, have a job that gets me out and about, which was something that I liked. Oh, it's also the kind of position where I could determine, here's my geographic territory, and this is how I'm going to market to them to recruit the appropriate people to our graduate program. That was the first time I had experienced something like that and was the taste, as you're asking me these questions, like, yeah, that was the taste that, that got put in my mouth of, oh, I like this independent thing. I don't know what it will look like afterwards. Because after I was a graduate, admissions officer. That's when I went afterwards, I went to get my master's in counseling psychology and then went on for my doctorate. And so I was in the academic arena for a long stint. But I knew that I didn't want to just do whether it was go the tenure route and become a professor or do the private practice in the traditional sense of doing therapy with people. I knew I wanted something more than that because I wanted to reach more people. 
I was about to ask about, well, you're a clinical psychologist <laughs> uh -huh. and why not go through the traditional, because you're an entrepreneur in that mm -hmm. respect and have an, having a practice mm -hmm. uh, and growing a traditional practice. <laughs> but I can see that it does tie you down. So. Yeah. And, and it's funny you should say that because every time you said the word traditional, the hair on the back of my head started to stand up. I was just like, oh, no, I'm not traditional. Remember, I, I said to you, I'm a curious person by nature. And so my whole thing is, okay, well, that's the way they do it in terms of you hang out your shingle and then you, you get referrals through insurance companies or people word of mouth. And then it just is like an in and out thing. And I was like, no, there's got to be more than that. There's got to be more to it than that. And that's what <laughs> prompted me to kind of do the other thing, mm -hmm. which is what I'm doing now. And so being a relationship personal trainer, a mother daughter. Mm -hmm. Mother daughter relationship. Specifically. <laughs> That opens you up to discuss and help folks beyond North Carolina and New Jersey. Mm -hmm. But are there lines that you have to draw on being a psychologist versus a personal trainer? I mean, is there yeah. stuff that you have to be aware of and, yes. and be very careful of? Yes, I am very, and I, 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 I'm glad you asked that question. I am licensed as as you said, a clinical psychologist, board certified as a sports psychologist. We won't talk about the sports psychologist board certification yet. Just in terms of licensure as a psychologist, I can only practice therapy, meaning doing any kind of mental, emotional, or behavioral work with folks who are residing in the states in which I'm licensed and in which they reside, and that is in North Carolina and New Jersey. That's under the umbrella of doing therapy with people, intensive clinical work. Under the umbrella of being a consultant, and because I don't like the word consultant, and I think personal trainer kind of fits me better because mm -hmm. it gets at the heart of what I'm trying to do with folks. Under that heading, we'll just use consultant, I can go across state lines and provide advice, education, teachings, instruction to reach more people. And so when someone is engaged with me either one-on-one -on -one for consultation slash mother-daughter relationship personal training, or if they're engaged with me, say, in one of my group programs, and I use that in big quotations, programs for moms and daughters, whether it's online or through an online course, that is all under the auspices of education. I'm educating folks. I'm not doing therapy with them. And so I can go across state lines with regards to that. You wrote your, your book. You're mm -hmm. in your corporate life. You wrote your book, right? Wait, you, you mean what mothers never tell their daughters? Mm -hmm. Oh, I wrote, I wrote that book not during my corporate years. No? No. I wrote that book four years ago. So I was... You already I, took the lead. I, 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 was, I was already... I had already had my private practice for about six years. Oh. And, then we, and, then we mo and then we moved from New Jersey to North Carolina. And then... I had a big pause in my life where I had, had to have some surgery. And then while I was convalescing, I was sort of like, hmm, what do I really want to do? What's on my heart to do? And it was a really good moment for me to just really reassess, ask the questions. Remember I told you? I was yeah. curious. It's like, what really floats my boat? Helping mom. Okay. So let me do that. <laughs> so uh, that's what led to the book. Mm -hmm. So you were in private practice. You left corporate, you were in private practice as a clinical psychologist, building right. that practice. Right. I went, I went from corporate to graduate school within higher ed, got clinically trained, got licensed, then was in private practice, and then went out to branch out on my own. So you I just are, tired myself out. <laughs> this, is, this is awesome. So you have been an entrepreneur more than six, more than uh, four years, you you just made a pivot because right. you didn't want to have that. I'm going to say it traditional, traditional, <laughs> traditional office, right? Which exactly. Is so cool because we put ourselves in this box that okay, this is what I'm supposed to do now because right. that's what everybody else did. And I just love right. that your book had opened you up uh, so much. So why specifically mother daughter relationships? Why are you focused on that? When there, you could be so much more broad. <laughs> um, well, I actually, the, the title, I have to tell you about the title of the book. It actually came out of 
my daughters were in middle school at the t- in, at the time, and I was while I was convalescing, I was thinking about you know, the times where I've said to my husband, ah, and I just want to pull my hair out, man, they just don't understand what it is that I'm trying to do. And there's so much I can't tell them yet. I just have to still be mom. And that's where the title came from. So it was really birthed out of my desire to one, help my daughters understand what made me tick. Because I think that if they, and at back then, I thought that if they understood that and then read this book, it would make sense to them, all the stuff I've been trying to do all these years. But then as I was content, before I even put you know, my fingers to typing the book, I started encountering a lot of young moms, younger than I am, who had daughters who were like below age 10. And every time I would see them in the cul-de-sac where we lived, interacting with them, they would do certain things whether it's unintentionally, but they, I could tell that they couldn't see the impact that it was having on their daughters in that moment. And that would pain me like the Dickens. And I thought to myself, well, how can I help more moms like that just be more aware to actually pause to consider their behavior in the moment or even before the moment happens? And so that's what kind of prompted me thinking, okay, well, I'll write a book. And then I told you, getting uh, connected with AAE, I was like, oh, I can actually do this, this thing that's very pa- a big passion for me, and actually do it for a living. As I got into it, and again, I've heard this thing said, it's almost clarity comes in the doing. You know, I knew mother-daughter relationships, but I didn't know the why. Remember, I, I'm very mm-hmm. curious. And then as I kept doing over these last several years, probably about a year and a half ago, a light bulb went on. It was like, oh, my heart, I love younger people, like the next generation. And I found that if I can help the next generation one mom at a time, that will actually help the next generation because they have to go back to mom. So I was like, well, let me just put the young people aside here and let me just really just help the moms. And it's almost like moms are the, it's the best, most important leadership position you'll ever have. And so if I can help moms be the kind of leaders that they desire to be and want to be and have that play out in a way that is more meaningful and having more connection with their daughters, who, if they choose to be moms in the future, they're going to be raising the next generation of sons and daughters. I just see this as my leaving a legacy with, you know, the next generation, just paying it forward, uh, because I didn't have the kind of relationship with my mom that I now help moms have. And, and I have a better relationship with my daughters. Uh, both of them had read my book, <laughs> you know, at different points in time. And I remember one of them called me from or texted me from college when pre-COVID. She had these little tear emojis. And I was like, what? And I responded back, is everything okay? She's like, I just finished reading your book. Now I understand. I, I get goosebumps just thinking about it because to hear her say that, it just put our relationship on a new level. And I want every mom to have those moments and not have to wait until their daughters are mothers themselves if they choose to be, to have that close connection with them. I believe they can have it from the get-go. When you're in the midst of, when you're wishing that they understood what, they, what you're going through, mm-hmm. as mothers... Will we have that period? Will all of us have that period because daughters are are finding independence or oh yeah, (laughs) yeah, and and it's it's up to us as and I love how you said we as mothers need to think of ourselves as leaders. We're, we are leaders in our household and how yes. we lead our children along a path, and so there's going to be a difficult patch. Yes, you're, actually, you're telling me, <laughs> and it's how we lead that helps the difficult patch. Helps yes, hinders. <laughs> yeah, uh, mothers and daughters have a different relationship arc than mothers and sons, and I, and I, I, I and I'll just explain it in this regard. Your daughter, once she's born, okay, is you are the first example to her of what being a female is all about, and throughout the arc of anybody's development, they call it child development, throughout that arc, there's the toddler, zero to toddler stage, then there's uh, elementary school stage, then there's middle school, 
uh, high school and then college and beyond, through each of those stages, there are ways in which a daughter, especially when she becomes a tween teen, where she's developing her sense of who she is. And when she gets to that tween teen stage, that's when her identity, she's trying to figure out, okay, so my mom, this person who, who's been with me all this time, I know she's female, but I don't know who I am apart from her, and I'm trying to figure it out. Then you throw in all the hormones, the social pressures, and things of that nature. They are bombarded with so much. And if a mom can just hear this one point, she's going through it for the first time. You're going through, you've already been through it, and are going through it a second time, but in her presence. And that's where a lot of the friction can start to happen because a mother starts to relive <laughs> her life. I had a client who was telling me that she was very concerned about her daughter starting middle school. And I, as we went through the work together as, indiv as an individual consultation, come to find out that after I pointed out some things, come to find out she realized, hey, there was a lot of stuff that was going on for her personally when she was her daughter's age that she was not aware of. And when she was able to identify that, then she was able to separate herself from getting caught up in what it was she was fearful of happening for her daughter entering middle school. And she and her daughter now have a very smooth operating kind of relationship as her daughter's made that transition. But it's very important for um, moms to understand that their daughter is trying to figure it out. And our role as a mom is to actually help them navigate each of those particular segments of time as someone who is giving her the space to be her, not a mini me of yourself, not your rendition of how you think it should should go, but actually be present with her in her discovery process. That, There's a big difference between the two. Yes. Uh, having raised a daughter, mm -hmm. I I know the the difficult tween and teen years, mm -hmm. but I'm very grateful that it wasn't as difficult as some. But maybe, and my daughter now in her mid twenties and a mother herself. Mm -hmm. uh, she has told me, it's like, you know, what's cool about you, mom, is that you like listened to me when I was younger. And, and that's a big thing. Oh, yes. Listening. And that's a big thing in any relationship. <laughs> really. Yes. We um, all want to be heard. Like mm -hmm. at, at our core, if you kind of can think of it, I always talk about um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But, you know, those first two rungs of that triangle have to do with, do we feel safe? Do we feel secure and do we feel satiated? And even though those things can, in early on in our childhood and our growing up, can be related to physical things. Okay, are we safe? Okay, do we have a house? Do you have an apartment? Do we have a place to stay? You know, are we secure? Okay, is everything kind of consistent? Having, do we feel satiated? Is there food in my belly? Do I know when the meals are happening? Even though those are physical things, there's an emotional and mental component to that that also needs to be attended to. With all the stuff that's, that's going on, it's very important for moms to just be cognizant of that as they're going through those stages. And listening is one of those things that can make a young lady feel safe, secure, and, and fed. Because if you're listening, then you know how to speak into her life at those different points in time. In your line of work, you're helping mothers and daughters with mm -hmm. their relationship. Mm -hmm. And you have some fantastic programs that you offer. Can you uh, speak into that? First of all, I know that you have a podcast because I listen to it. So right. <laughs> can you tell us, uh, because people can follow you in, in a free manner mm -hmm. through your podcast and get mm -hmm. to know you and, ha and have a tremendous amount of help. So tell us about your podcast first. Yeah, uh, my podcast is called Mother Daughter Connections. Uh, it comes out every Monday morning. Uh, and it's really geared towards uh, equipping, encouraging, and uh, educating moms about their mother-daughter relationship. And it's not just 
you know, if you're the, the mom listening right now, it's not just your relationship with your daughter below you, but it's also in relationship to your own mom, you know, whether or not she's here, still here or not. So it's, it's about that. And I bring on, uh, periodically, I'll bring on different guests who bring something to offer. And as you, as you listen to any of the, the guest episodes, because I know I've had you on, Gela, and you're going to be on again <laughs> uh, in the coming months. I, I'm trying to help moms get exposed to other mom's stories so that we can feel that we're not by ourselves in it. No mom, I always say mom, no mom is an island, okay? We, all, we need community. One of the traps I think moms can sometimes get into is feeling that they have to do it all on their own, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, by themselves. And that is not the case. So the other way that folks can connect with me is through my Facebook group. Uh, which is also called Mother Daughter Connections F, the letter F and the letter B, Facebook. Um, so Mother Daughter Connections FB. There's a wonderful community of moms in that group who support each other. I make myself present in there periodically so that folks can, you know, hear a timely tip, uh, some other thoughts that they might not hear on the podcast. Sometimes I'll share materials there that I think might be of helpful, helpful to folks. And then moms pitch in and share their information and resources. And every month we have a, a Zoom meetup now <laughs> since it's awesome. postcode, which is really neat. Uh, and, and folks, we just hang out for a half hour. It's a half hour where we don't have to think about <laughs> Yeah. The kids. Yeah, I had one mom who's actually a nurse, and she, in between, she had us on, on she had her thing phased out, but she would pop on every every couple of minutes, saying, "I'm still here. I'm listening. I'm mm -hmm. treating a patient right now," kind of stuff. So yeah, and so and then in terms of uh, programs, uh, I'm right now in the midst of taking a, a core group of moms through uh, an eight meeting program called the Mother Daughter Connection Cure which is a program where I go into more detail uh, than what's covered in my book, where I walk moms through a five-phase process of examination, identification, prioritization, boundary building, and then um, relationship re-engagement so that they can break the cycles that have been happening with their daughter or mother mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that have been causing them uh, some distress. So we tend to think of when you're in distress, that's when, I mean, we need a problem to solve. You're helping people to solve a problem, the mother-daughter relationship. Mm -hmm. I find that your programs are very helpful at any stage. I feel like I'm in this in-between stage. I've got an adult daughter, mm -hmm. love that relationship with her. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a mother that it's weird for me that it's now I'm transitioning from not only my mother, but my mother-in-law mm. uh, helping in their retirement years and mm -hmm. going through that mm -hmm. transition and putting on my big girl pants, I guess you can say, <laughs> on, on, on helping take care of yes. parents yes. And, instead of children. It's, it's weird. And, yes. And I find that your programs, your information is super helpful. I appreciate what you produce. Oh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate you saying that because um, when I wrote my book, it's the only book out there that I write from the perspective of a daughter raised by a single mom. I write mm -hmm. from the perspective of a mom who's the mom of twin daughters. And I write from the, pers and what I, what, the, what I then do is I put on my clinical hat in the book and I lend that perspective to just give a broader, okay, this is what's going on or what has been going on. And I did that because I wanted moms to see that they are first and foremost daughters and that the patterns that they've had with their own mom have a way of kind of seeping into other things, even as their own mom gets older because that transition like you said you're kind of stuck in in this new kind of space which feels very i know it feels different but it's also one that requires uh, an even more delicate balance because your mom again i'm not you know mm -hmm. stepping in if i if i pry too much <laughs> we're family um right. <laughs> <laughs> you know your mom having to deal with being sort of uh more dependent. And that is a trip 
of and a half on someone who has gone so long in her life of being the one relied on to now having to rely on. And if you don't pause to consider as the adult daughter, how your actions and or words might get misinterpreted or what, if you're just bumbling into it, it, it can end up making that transition not so great. And so I'm so glad that you're getting a lot out of the stuff that I'm covering on my podcast and thinking about that stuff and pausing to consider it because that's, that's what it was intended to do is to also help it for those who are at that stage too. So thank you for saying that. You're obviously passionate and very knowledgeable about the subject. As a business owner, transitioning from corporate into your mm -hmm. practice and mm -hmm. into an online business, do you have any advice for someone else that's thinking about taking the leap out of a traditional job? <laughs> <laughs> to, Did you see my hair stand up? <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, but do you have any advice uh, for those that are field pulled that way, but are apprehensive? Oh, gosh. If I, if I have a, a couple of things that come to mind. One is don't snuff out your curiosity or your passion. That's the first thing. That's like the groundwork. On top of that, I think it's very important to count costs. And by that, I'm not just talking about costs in terms of money, but costs in terms of time and energy. Because it is going to be, it's going to require a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are moms out there, even now, who are stressed out, strung out, you know, they're just mm -hmm. balancing so much, especially since COVID. But still, the best gift you can give your daughter is to actually not deny yourself the opportunity to actually pursue your passion. I can't begin to tell you, especially if you listen to my podcast and the moms I've had on, the number of times I've heard, not just on the podcast with my guests, but in practice also, adult daughters who have said that they had felt some kind of way seeing their mom toil, 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 and deny herself, but that the moment the mom actually realized what she'd been denying herself and then started partaking of something that would give her some pleasure, give her some refreshment, give her mm -hmm. some, some what, that it, it actually inspired their young daughter to know that there's more to life than just toil, toil, toil. And I think that's a great thing. So definitely count the cost, get support. That's the second thing I would say, because no mom is an island and no entrepreneur can do things on their own. You need help. So ask for help, get support. And then also keep perspective. That would be the third thing in that, you know, no baby came out of the womb walking and no toddler, well, maybe I know my toddler ran, but <laughs> I had one that was walking at seven months and then she was running at eight. I was just like, whoa, wow. wait. So, um, but no, but she didn't come out of the womb running. So keep perspective on where you are in the, the progress of your business pursuit, your solopreneurship pursuit. It happens in stages. It's a marathon and you can't run a marathon in a sprint. Well, with your experience, we can learn from you. Was there anything that you know now that you wish you knew then? I did not. <laughs> I think I was a dinosaur that was dragged into the technology age <laughs> of social media. I did not know how central it is or how central it would become in terms of finding ways to connect with people. I appreciate it more so, especially since I call it the cosmic pause of 2020. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, especially just seeing, wow, you know, there's something to be said for human interaction. How can I make this, this gift of technology help with that in mm -hmm. terms of interpersonal interaction? And so I think what I know now is that it's central and I should prioritize it, which I didn't earlier, <laughs> especially mm -hmm. after my book came out, I was kicking and screaming, what? I have to do what? Um, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so now I've embraced it more. It's like, okay, somebody teach me help. <laughs> I love that you, embra that you embrace technology. You're like, you see that, hey, this can serve me. I'm not going to let me not knowing how to do it stop yeah. me. I love right. that about you because yeah. I... <laughs> I see too many folks saying, ah, I don't know how to do it. And that stops them. That's their 
their blocker. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we have so many free or affordable tools out there that mm -hmm. we can all start mm -hmm. our own thing and follow our passion and earn a great living doing so. Right. And that's what I love so much about what you do with Scrivener Solutions is, uh, can I tell, I'm going to just tell the story, you know, Gail and I were part of an online community at one point, and I asked a question in that community, and she back channeled me and said, well, if you need help, and for me at that time, I was just on the cusp of getting used to the to the process of asking for help. So when you reached out to me, it's like, well, if you need help, I'm here. That was like one of the kindest things that I had experienced at that point. We've been friends ever since. You've midwifed the birth of my <laughs> podcast, <laughs> you know, uh, in just taking the time to actually meet a person where they are and then normalizing and so gently guiding them through the process of what it would take to bring something to fruition. And I think that's one thing, one of the things that I, that I, I love about you, which you bring and it infuses everything you do with Scrivener Solutions. And so definitely asking for help and getting support, embracing the process, don't be afraid, you can do it. Well, I love that, that you do embrace the technology. And it was such a great experience to just guide you along. And you did it. You did it all yourself. And you, pu you publish and produce your own podcast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just love it. I, lo <laughs> I love what you do. And we could talk all day. Oh, we could gosh. Talk all day. We've talked about your podcast and how people can follow you. And do you have any last uh, words of advice for a budding entrepreneur, solopreneur. Give yourself some grace uh, for the seasons of life that you're in or will be going through. So there will be seasons where as you're pursuing this entrepreneurial endeavor, where life is just still happening and you're going to feel tugged in different directions, it's okay to readjust your expectations for yourself and that, that that is not an, an indication, a negative indication on you, your dream, or the value that you bring to the table. Remember, there's only one you, and no one else can deliver that message like how you can. So definitely continue to do, do the do. Thanks so much. I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for being here today. Thanks so much for having me, Gail. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening. You'll find all the resources and contact links in the show notes. I learn something new every time Dr. Deering and I have the opportunity to get together. I love that her teachings is specifically aimed toward mother-daughter relationships, but I also learned so much from her entrepreneurial experiences. I love that she said that we must give ourselves grace and have the right perspective of where we are in our entrepreneurial journey. Life is so fast. It moves so fast. And I think that we all feel like we should be at the ending point, whatever that ending point should be. Somehow we can get to that point by skipping steps and we become frustrated and we spin our wheels. Have the right perspective of where we're at in our journey. Thanks, Dr. Deering, for wonderful advice. Now, if you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe in your favorite podcast player. And if you're feeling extra generous, a nice review would be greatly appreciated. Until next time, have a fantastic week.